Well, I think I already uh, have told you what it is we're looking at this evening. If you would, uh, well, turn in your Bibles if you'd like to, to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. You know, I, I, I don't have time to give, as it were, uh, a, uh, an apology, although not in the sense that uh, we think of that word, as to why I believe that this text is referring to the second coming of Christ. Uh, you do know that there are many people today in broad evangelical churches that believe that this passage is referring to a kind of a coming of Christ that takes place uh, just before the tribulation period to rapture the church out of the, of the world and then to, uh, as it were, start the clock again for Israel to complete the 70 weeks that they believe have not been fulfilled. And I hope you remember some of the things we've been looking at. 70 weeks have been fulfilled. Uh, Christ doesn't come several times. He only comes just once. He doesn't raise the dead several times. He raises them all at once. And he changes all the living at once and gathers everyone together. And we're going to be looking at that this evening. So I want you to realize that this text is talking about the second coming of Christ. This is not talking about his coming in judgment in 70 AD, but his coming at the very end to raise all the dead and to gather all the living. Paul writes this in 1 Thessalonians 4, beginning in verse 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this evening. Now, again, the question has uh, certainly, and I'm sure, raised, been raised in your, in your minds as we've looked at all these passages regarding the coming of Christ in 70 AD to bring judgment against Israel, that if all these passages are really referring to that coming of Christ in judgment, then which passages have to do with his second coming at the end of the world to bring a definitive end to all things? Is there really anything in the Bible that speaks about the second coming? And if so, how can you really tell the difference? Well, that's the question I think it would be helpful for us uh, to examine this evening. And I thought we could do it by answering four questions. And those of you who have the outline, if you saw, they're in the, they are in the back. Uh, these are the four questions. First of all, why should you believe in the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, secondly, what will happen when Jesus comes again? By the way, in answering that question, we'll be able to see those particular features about the second coming that are true only of it, that are not true of his coming in judgment in 70 AD. Thirdly, why should you believe the second coming is still future and that it didn't actually happen in 70 AD. And what should you look for that will tell you that the second coming is actually near? Now, perhaps as we spend some time looking at the features of the second coming, it will not only give us a, um, a firm understanding of what the Lord promises is going to happen then, but it may also help convince us that the passages we were looking at before regarding 70 AD really do have to do with 70 AD and don't have to do with the second coming. I said may. I, I'm, I know enough by this time to realize that not everyone's always going to be convinced by these things. But again, we need to examine everything by Scripture and hold fast to that which we believe Scripture is telling us. So first of all, why should you believe that Christ is coming again? Why should you believe in the second coming? And again, let's define what that is. There are only two comings of Christ that I'm aware of in Scripture, although sometimes we talk about his coming for us at death. Uh, there is the first coming of our Lord Jesus Christ when the Son of God became a man. 
when he took our nature, when he lived for us and, and died for us in order to bring us redemption and then, of course, rose again from the dead and ascended into heaven. That was his first coming. The Bible tells us that, that there's also a second coming. When Jesus is going to return bodily to the earth in order to set into motion a series of events that's going to bring uh, the culmination of all things, uh, the wrapping up, the conclusion of all things. And those events are these, the raising of the dead, the translation of all the living, the final judgment and separation of all men who have ever lived, all time, and then the bringing in of the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, that, by the way, is the eternal state. So when Jesus comes again, he's going to set in motion a series of events that is going to culminate in the eternal state. Now, why should you believe that that is going to happen? You know, this is one of the easiest questions to answer, isn't it? Because we believe it's going to happen for the same reason we believe that anything that the Bible says is going to take place or that any of it is true because God has said it in his word. The Lord has given to us uh, a book that is inspired, that is God-breathed, that tells us everything that we need to know. It tells us everything that we need to know as far as how we should live for the glory of God. It, it reveals to us, as we saw, uh, well, what we are to believe concerning God and also what he would require of us. In other words, it helps us to know what we are to do in order to glorify the one who loved us and died for us, in order to serve him in a way that, that would be pleasing to him. It gives us all that we need with regard to our practice, but it also reveals to us everything that we need to believe. It is for us a rule of faith. It not only tells us what we're like and what we need as far as salvation, but it tells us what God is like it tells us who he is, what he has done, and of course, what it is that he yet intends to do. Now, you should believe in the second coming because God tells us that that is, in fact, what's going to happen in his word. We just saw as much in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, in verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. This is the fulfillment of what the angels told the disciples was going to happen when they stood there staring up in the sky as Jesus ascended and then the cloud received, them out, received him out of their sight. The angel said, this Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. We believe in the second coming because that's what the Bible teaches. Now we're going to see that, of course, several more times in these uh, coming points, but this should be enough for now. So the, that's the answer to the first question. Why do we believe in it? Now well, the Bible teaches it. Now secondly, what's going to happen when Jesus Christ returns? And again, this is answering the question, how can you know in Scripture which passages are speaking about the second coming and which passages are speaking about 70 A.D.? Again, it can be confusing because a lot of the passages that we were looking at regarding uh, the Lord's coming to judge Israel uh, contain several of the images that we would expect to see in the second coming. For instance, our Lord Jesus Christ coming in a cloud. That sounds very similar to what the angel said to the disciples. He's going to come again as you saw him leave. Well, he left in a cloud. He's going to return, it seems, in a cloud. The changes that take place in the heavens, as far as the sun, moon, and the stars darkening and the stars falling from the heavens and so forth, the involvement of the angels being sent to gather together the elect, those, those images all seem to be speaking about the second coming, and yet we saw they were referring to 70 AD. Now, how can we tell if these passages are speaking about one or the other since? Judgment passages have a number of things in common. Well, the simple answer is uh, this. 
that if the passages include the things that we know that Jesus Christ is going to do or he's going to bring about at his second coming that have to do with the culmination or the wrapping up of this present world in order to usher in the new world, then we can know that those passages are referring to the second coming. If, if they don't refer to those things, it's likely that they're not, although that may not be absolute. Certainly when it contains those things, they are. Now what are those things, again, that Jesus is going to bring about when he returns? Well, I've already mentioned them, but I'm going to mention them several times so that we don't miss them. He is going to raise all the dead. He is going to translate or convert or gather up or catch up all the living. He is going to gather them together for the final judgment. There is going to be the final separation and then the renovation of the old heavens and the old earth and the bringing in of the new creation. So let's take a look at these things. First of all, when Jesus comes the second time, he is going to raise all the dead. That's what Paul is talking about in this text in 1 Thessalonians. That's one of the ways we can know that he is referring to the second coming. He's writing to comfort them, to comfort them regarding those who have fallen asleep in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's actually writing this to comfort not only them, but to comfort you and me with regard to those whom we love who have gone on to be with the Lord. He tells you that you don't have to grieve as others who have no hope. Because when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, he is going to bring them with him. And not only that, but he's going to raise their bodies reunite them with their souls, and then they, along with us, will always be with the Lord. Paul says, when Jesus descends, the dead in Christ shall rise first. By the way, I hope you remember that our Lord Jesus Christ tells us on another occasion that when he returns, he's not going to raise just the dead that belong to him but he's actually going to raise all the dead at the same time. He says in John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, this is one you should memorize if you want to show somebody that all the dead are raised at the same time. Jesus had just told them that an hour is, is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear shall live. He was talking about spiritual resurrection through the gospel. But then he goes on to say, do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tomb shall hear his voice and will come forth, those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. Again, an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and they will all come forth some to judgment and some to rewards, depending upon, of course, whether you love the Lord, whether you've trusted the Lord, and you're living for his glory. Now, the reason why Paul, in, in the text in 1 Thessalonians, is focusing on believers is because he was seeking to give us comfort regarding those who have departed in the Lord. His purpose was not to talk about the resurrection in general, but rather that specific part of the resurrection that would give us comfort. And that is our loved ones will not, uh, well, we will not precede our loved ones, but they will actually come with the Lord Jesus and their bodies will be raised. And after that takes place, then we will be caught up together with them. Doesn't mean that the rest of the dead are not raised. Jesus tells us plainly in John chapter five, that's exactly what's going to happen. But you'll notice that in all the passages that we've been looking at with regard to 70 AD, that there was no mention of the resurrection in any of them. The Olivet Discourse does not talk about the resurrection. Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, does not talk about even a partial resurrection before, as it were, the, um, the coming of the 70th week of Daniel, as many today believe, or really in the book of Revelation, at least in that part of the book that leads all the way up to the millennium where we believe it transitions from 70 AD to what's going on right now. 
So that's one major difference between those passages, again referring to 70 AD, and those having to do with the second coming. Those having to do with the second coming include the resurrection. Now another difference is all the living will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Again, we saw this in our passage in verse 17. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 and 52, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Notice that there is an order here. There is a sequence. The dead are raised first, and then the living are changed. Now, again, the other passages don't talk about the catching up of the living into the air to meet the Lord. The Olivet Discourse does talk about the angels gathering the elect. And those who want to see the second coming here do assume that, that this is the angels raising the dead and gathering the living Christians together. Now, why do they believe that? Well, there is a passage in Scripture that talks about the rich man and Lazarus. And when the rich man dies, he lifts up his eyes in Hades. But when Lazarus dies, the angels carry him to Abraham's bosom, which is the Lord. Or in heaven, I should say. It's taking him to, to heaven. But are the angels involved in the raising of your body if you've died by the time the Lord returns or in, in translating you or converting you and catching you up in the air if you're still alive when he returns? Are the angels involved in the bodies of the living or dead believers in this sense? Now, we're not actually told in Scripture anyway, anywhere that they are, that, that it's the angels that actually uh, catch us up or transform us or raise our dead bodies. Unless that's what Jesus is referring to by the sending of his angels to gather together his elect, which is what many believe. But let's not forget what we saw, that Jesus, when he was describing what was going to happen in the Olivet Discourse, said that this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. In other words, you will not die, he was saying to his disciples, until all these things that I have talked about actually come to pass, which means that the sending of the angels to gather the elect out of the, out of the earth is actually something I should, actually when I think about it, it actually started after 70 AD, but it doesn't refer, at least in my estimation, to, to this particular thing. Again, we, we have nothing in scripture that tells us that the angels are the ones who actually transform us or catch up our bodies or raise our bodies. That is a feature that takes place, though, at the second coming. Those, these passages we looked at with regard to 70 AD talk about the translation of all the living? No. Now, thirdly, when he comes again, he is gathering everybody together for judgment. That's the reason why he raises the dead. That's the reason why he translates all the living so that he might gather all the nations together. Everyone who has ever lived under heaven in one place at one time for the final judgment. Paul tells us that actually if we were to continue reading in 1 Thessalonians as we move into chapter 5, that the coming of the day of the Lord follows the resurrection and the translation. The day of the Lord is the day of his judgment. John tells us in the book of Revelation that after Jesus returns in flaming fire to destroy his enemies, that all the dead are raised and they are judged at the final judgment. Now you can know that a passage has to do with the second coming when it includes the final judgment and separation. Now I should mention in Matthew's gospel that Jesus describes the final judgment at the very end of the Olivet Discourse. He talks about the sheep and goat judgment. Now, was Jesus telling us that the sheep and goat judgment was going to take place in 70 AD? Obviously not. Uh, does, does he mean that uh, what he said in the rest of the Olivet Discourse has to do with the second coming? 
Well, I don't think he was saying that either because there does appear to be a definitive break in what Jesus is talking about when he introduces the topic of the sheep and goat judgment in Matthew 25, verse 31. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him. Why does Jesus bring it up in the context of what he was talking about with regard to 70 AD? You know, that's a question that biblical interpreters have been wrestling with for centuries. One possible answer to that question is that Jesus was, in, was, tr was trying to distinguish the two in their minds rather than to confuse them as to what was going to take place in 70 AD and what was going to take place in the future. That he told them about the future judgment to distinguish it from what he was talking about with regard to 70 AD. But again, here is something that we can use to distinguish the second coming from 70 AD. It includes the final judgment and separation. And then finally, at the second coming, the heavens and the earth. The old heavens and the earth are going to be burned up and renovated, and the new heavens and the new earth are going to come. But Peter tells us as much in 2 Peter 3 when he talks about the coming of the day of the Lord in which the present heavens and earth are going to pass away with a roar. The elements are going to melt. The creation is going to be set free from its corruption, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8 may have something to do with what Paul refers to in 2 Thessalonians. Sorry, I don't have time to read all these passages. We're covering a lot of ground. But when he says that the Lord is going to be revealed from heaven in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who had persecuted the Thessalonians. There's going to be fire associated with the coming of Christ, and perhaps it's this fire that burns up the old creation. Now, in the Olivet Discourse, Jesus does talk about changes in the heavens in connection with 70 AD. But he doesn't say anything about the destruction of the earth, destruction of those heavens, and the bringing in of the new creation. We already saw that Jesus was using Old Testament imagery to refer to the overthrow of that nation. The darkening of the heavens is a very common image used in the Old Testament to refer to the overthrow of a political entity. And let's not forget, Jesus said that was going to happen before that generation, then living, passed away. So you can know the Bible is talking about the second coming when it talks about the new heavens and the new earth and the destruction of the old heavens and the old earth. When Jesus comes in the second coming, it is to put a final end to what we see now to bring in the new. Basically, it is the culmination. It is to wrap up everything. It is to bring it to a decisive end. So how do we know which passage is referring to the second coming? It's those passages that have to do with the, the culmination, the consummation, the conclusion of all things, which is what happens with the resurrection, the translation of all the living, the final judgment, final separation, the destruction of the present heavens and the earth, and the bringing in of the new heavens and the new earth. Now thirdly, you know, we've already seen that we, you know, why we should believe it and what it is that distinguishes the second coming. Thirdly, why should you believe that this is still future? That seems like a ridiculous question, doesn't it? Because are we currently in the, the eternal state? I mean, have all these things already happened? Well, it's interesting that there are people who believe that. There are Christians who believe that, called full preterists, called radical preterists. They can't really make a distinction between what happens in 70 AD and the passages that have to do with the second coming. They believe that that was the second coming in 70 AD. They believe that Jesus Christ came, that he raised all the dead, that he translated all the living believers, not all the people of the world, obviously, that the final judgment has taken place, the old heavens and the old earth have passed away, and this is the new creation. Boy, this is the new creation. What do we have to look forward to, right? Um, except they do believe that when we die, that we do go to heaven, 
though because the resurrection has already taken place, our bodies forever remain in the earth. We never get our new bodies. That's only for the people who were raised in 70 AD. Now, why shouldn't you agree with them? Why should you believe the second coming is still future? Well, I hope you can already see. There's no evidence that a resurrection took place. There's no evidence in church history that Christians suddenly disappeared. There was certainly no destruction of the present heavens and earth and the bringing in of the new or a final judgment or separation. The Bible ties all these things together. They all happen when Jesus returns and it includes the entire world. I mean, all the people in the world and the entire created universe. Everything is brought to a conclusion. All the old has passed away and everything is made new again. That obviously hasn't happened. So we're still looking for that in the future. Now finally, what should you look for to tell you that the second coming is about to take place? You know, the Lord has given a very detailed description, or at least he did, to his disciples as far as what to look for for 70 AD. And the reason why he did was, as we've already seen, it was going to happen in their lifetime. And they had to be ready for it. If they weren't, then things were going to get tough for them really, really quick. So he gives them detailed instructions on what to look for so that when it takes place, not only they, but Everyone who has believed in the Lord Jesus Christ through their word can get out of Judea before that terrible judgment falls upon Israel. So again, detailed instructions because it was going to influence them. But you know, when it comes to the second coming, there doesn't seem to be a, a great deal of things, especially if you take all those things that we've seen regarding 70 AD and put those in 70 AD. There's really not a lot that talks about the second coming. And that may be because there's really only one thing you need to do to get ready for it. And that is trust the Lord Jesus Christ and live for his glory. You need to be doing as we saw this morning, living as Jesus would live if he were in your place. And that basically sums up everything. If you're doing that, you will be ready. Now, what we do know, though, with regard to the coming of the Lord, what the Lord has revealed is at least this much as far as when he is going to come. We do know from scripture that Jesus is reigning now. There's no question about that. And that he will continue to reign until all of his enemies are subdued under his feet. I think we all agree on that. According to the book of Revelation, he will reign until the millennium is over. It's at the end of the millennium that Satan is released. We know that he's going to come back to subdue the last enemy. And the last enemy is clearly death. So when is he going to come? When, when the rest of his enemies have been subdued and he comes to conquer death. Now we also know that Satan currently is bound. Jesus bound him in his first coming. He's the one that bound the strong man so he could plunder his house. And that that's going to continue until the millennium is over. And after that, uh, John tells us, Satan is going to be released. He's going to go out to deceive all the nations again and gather together everyone who is in his kingdom in one last escalating battle against the church. At that point, we read, Jesus comes again in fire and he destroys them. So there's two possibilities then as to how we can know when Jesus is going to return, what those signs are going to be. Actually, they kind of work out the same in either way. First of all, things are going to continue as they are now until Satan is released. And then when things get really bad for the church, when we see basically global persecution against the church, then we can know that Jesus is about to return to destroy them, to raise the dead, to gather the living, and so forth. So again, if this is the case, when you see the nations turning against the church, it's time to begin looking up. Boy, on that basis, we might begin to look up right now. But the other possibility is this, that the kingdom is going to continue to grow as long as Satan is bound, that Jesus' enemies are going to be systematically subdued under his feet, 
that that is going to usher in a time of prolonged righteousness and blessing to this world. And then Satan is going to be released. Then there's going to be the persecution of the church. And then is going to be the second coming. Now, if that's the way things are going to fall out, then what you should be looking for next would be that glorious expansion of the kingdom before Satan is released, the church is persecuted, and Jesus returns to destroy his enemies and to wrap up the present age. Now again, how it's going to turn out depends on how we understand scripture. Actually, it doesn't even depend on how we understand it. What it depends on is what the Lord has actually said. <laughs> so we try to do our best, but regardless of, of how it's going to turn out, we do know this, that whatever the Lord has planned, it's going to be glorious it's going to work out for your blessing and my blessing if you are ready for that event. And the only way you can be ready for it is to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Turn away from your sins and live for God's glory as Jesus would live if he were in your place, if he were living your life. So that's the safety zone. That's where you want to be. You want to be trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, and then it doesn't really matter when he comes, does it? Because you'll be ready for it. Well, may the Lord help us all to be ready, and may he help us also to be laboring for the glory of his kingdom, to advance that kingdom, to try to save as many people as we possibly can before our Lord returns, if in fact that's coming up next. Or may he help us to labor to advance his kingdom in order to see that glorious blessing that we've looked at in the past with regard to, again, the kingdom of heaven filling the earth. May he give us encouragement in that direction as well. But either way, to do his will and to glorify him in the short time that we have in this world. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us do that.